All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to lecture two of uh, group theory uh, of mathematical methods, my apologies, of which uh, group theory is the first section that we are covering. Uh, so in um, screen updates are not as fast as I would like them to be, I guess, but anyway, so I have to pause a little bit, right? So these are the axioms. It's closed under multiplication. Uh, there is an identity, there is an inverse, and uh, there is also one more, uh, um, a fourth uh, condition, that of associativity. So associativity means uh, that, uh, if you have uh, three elements, then you can uh, multiply uh, either G2 and G3 first and then multiply with G1 or uh, you know in a different order. So this is this is called, associativity right but a very important aspect is that groups need not be they need uh, this multiplicative this multiplication need not commute right so when it commutes we say that the group is abelian otherwise we call it non abelian So if G1, G2 is equal to uh, this, for all group elements, uh, then we, we say that the group is abelian, else uh, non-abelian, okay? Then I, I briefly mentioned uh, that there are several mathematical structures, algebras, vector spaces, rings, groups, and so on and so forth. And uh, by uh, changing the law laws, the required axioms, you get a different structure and uh, with different properties. So the first group that we looked at is S SO2, which is also the same as U1. Uh, so there is a group homo homomorphism which connects these two, right? And uh, so an element of U1 can be written as this exponential, an element of SO2 can be written as uh, this matrix, right? And the group homomorphism simply maps uh, the exponential to the matrix, right? And it's a one-to-one one -one mapping. So we have a group isomorphism between the two. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, U1, you can either uh, say that the element is represented by e to the i theta, but you can also put an integer n in there. And if you do that, then again, your uh, group multiplication is preserved, right? As long as you don't change the integer. So for every value of n, you have a separate representation of the group, okay? So uh, we, we say that the representations of U1 are labeled by, by integers, right? And each representation is one dimensional. One dimensional because it only has one element. Uh, then what is a group homomorphism? It's a map. Uh, from one group to another, which preserves the group multiplication property, right? So this, these two elements are in G2, and so their product is also in G2, right? So as an example, I gave you, talked about this group uh, Z2, which is a discrete group of two elements. You can think of it as the group of binary digits, right? So uh, which, which means addition mod two, 
or you can think of it as minus one and plus one with multiplication uh, as your ordinary integer multiplication. And uh, so there are, uh, so, and uh, let me briefly uh, just give you a bit of an overview of why group theory is so important for physics, okay? And the reason is because uh, physical systems have symmetries, right? So if a physical system has a symmetry, how uh, do we uh, express uh, the action of such a symmetry? So as an example, uh, you have, let's say the, uh, Schrodinger equation for a central potential. Okay. So what does the what does the Hamiltonian uh, look like? Okay. This is our Hamiltonian. Right. This is the kinetic term, and this is the potential. And it only depends on the R, right? So it's a that's why we call it a central potential. Now, if you look at this Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian is invariant under rotations, right? Uh, because del square is invariant under rotations, right? And V of R is also invariant. Why? Because it only depends on the radius r. And if you rotate, you don't change the, the radius doesn't change, right? So how would you, uh, so let's say that you have a state, okay? You have a state psi, which is a solution of this, uh, of the eigenvalue problem. Right, this is the eigenvalue problem, right? This is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, how would I uh, describe the uh, effect of a rotation on this state side, right? So I have my system, let's say this is my system in some, it's in a box. And I have my observer, right? Now what this observer does is that they perform a rotation of the system, all right? So my box is rotated, right? And not scaled. Okay. So here, the in the first case, if my state was psi, right? Now my state will be described by, will be different, right? It will be some psi prime. So psi prime should be related to psi in some way, right? And what should be the relation between psi prime and psi. Can anybody tell me? How will they be related? How do you go from one state to another state in the Hilbert space? For any two states, what do you do? Shall we perform some unitary operation? Well, yeah, okay. We, we act upon it with some operator, right? And this operator in general has to be a unitary operator, right? So there is some rotation and this rotation is represented by some classical matrix, 
right? This will be an element of SO3, let's say. And then this U will be an operator. It will be a unitary operator, right? Which is a function of this, which depends on this, uh, on the matrix, the rotation matrix, right? Now, if you have two consecutive rotations, let's say, right? So if you have two rotations, right? So you go from psi to psi prime and R2 to psi double prime, right? What is psi double prime? How do I describe it? I can write it as U of R2, right? The unitary operator corresponding to the second rotation acting on psi prime, which in turn can be written as the unitary operator corresponding to the first rotation acting on psi, right? But now you see that that one can take, one can go directly from psi to psi double prime, right? How? By acting upon the system with a rotation, which is a composition of R2 and R1, right? Because by the group, group multiplication property, we know that this will also be an element of SO3, right? So this means that we should be able to write psi double prime as U, right? R2, and then I put a, this circle, or I should put a dot. Well, I put a circle because just to indicate that it's a, it's a composition right, of two transformations. Right, now these two expressions should be equal. Uh, so these two are equal, which tells me that this unitary operator, right, satisfies this, uh, this requirement, right? So what does this tell me? This tells me that the, these operators U, they form a representation of SO3. Okay. And Remember that when I talked about um, the representations, I representations, what did I tell you? Okay, well, maybe I didn't mention it as clearly as I should have, right? So a group representation, and so this brings us to the definition of a group representation. Okay. So given some vector space V, okay. A representation, uh, we'll say R of a group G on V, right, is given by uh, a map from G to the set of operators which set of operators which act on the vector space right that set of operators can be represented in this way v cross v 
if you if you don't understand this notation don't worry too much about it just think of this as a map from the group to the set of operators acting on b right so this is this means that if you have for some group element right there exists an operator r right which is an which is a function of g1 which acts on b and what does this r do it takes the vector space to itself right so if i have some vector then this gives me some other vector which is in the same vector space right now the important point to note here right is that for a given group the representation depends on the choice of your vector space okay so what this means is one group right any group can have many different representations depending on the vector space on which that group acts right so depending on the choice of b right now in i i think in quantum mechanics one near the end of the last semester i gave you an example of this right so for instance you can consider the following you can consider uh a particle with in one half right so such a particle the state is given by a two dimensional vector right alpha beta which i can write as this yes, is excuse me sir yeah this are this r of g1 acting on v means uh, the g1 element of group g uh, acted on a vector space right yeah but but g1 is mm -hmm. an abstract is an abstract quantity okay it's an abstract object okay so so the thing is that that same group element can act on many different kinds of objects so okay so in the example that i'm going to give you for instance here a group of rotations right you can have an observer in a lab right and this observer there is a spin one half particle this spin one half particle is described by a state psi now this observer performs a rotation of the experimental apparatus okay Okay, one second. Um, just give me one second. Perfect. Okay, good. So. so what happens to the state right the state of the system will also change right to some other psi prime this psi prime will be related to psi by some 2 by 2 matrix right because it's a two dimensional vector space right 
yes so psi prime is equal to some unitary operator right but this unitary operator will depend on the rotation right oops okay so what does this do this gives us a two dimensional representation of the rotation group why is it two dimensional it's two dimensional because the, these operators are two dimensional matrices right okay i mean you and this this is abstract but once you understand it it's actually very beautiful and it's very useful because it unifies many many aspects of physics now you can consider instead of a spin one half particle right you can consider a vector for example some classical object right like a rod so you have some rod the orientation of this rod is given by some by some unit vector n under the action of a rotation what happens the orientation changes right and how do we describe the change in orientation we say that there is some matrix right some 3 by 3 matrix which acts on the right on the vector to rotate it what does this give us this gives us a three dimensional representation of s to the right and this three dimensional representation by the way is called the fundamental representation okay so each group has a fundamental representation okay so you can see right that there are two different kinds of objects there's a spin one half object there's a vector classical vector they are both affected by the action of the group right but they transform under different representations of the same group right now a third example of the same of the same uh, same group right is you can consider uh, the for the same observer okay and well Right. How do I draw? Okay. So, yeah, all my observers don't have to look like men, right? So this observer sees. In this case, the system is a hydrogen atom. Let's say. So I have an electron, right? the state of the electron is described by some function by some wave function like which looks like this right and again if you find this confu this notation to be confusing don't worry about it just think of this just think of the state as being represented by this function Psi of r, fine. Right? Now one second, I need to. Yeah. Okay. Now again, I perform a rotation. Okay. So let me. Yeah. 
Okay, now again, I perform a rotation of my system. And what happens? My system is now described by a state, which is some function of my new coordinates, right? Psi r prime, right? Because under this rotation, my coordinates change, right? So the question is, how is psi r prime related to psi r, right? So in the previous two cases, what did we have? We just had a multiplication by a matrix, a two-dimensional matrix or three-dimensional matrix, right? In this case, the uh, description is a little bit more complicated. Why is that the case? It's the case because here, we are talking about a two-dimensional state, right? The state space is two-dimensional. So your operators are two, two by two matrices. Here, your state space is three-dimensional. So your operators are three by three matrices. But if you consider a state like this, right? Which depends on continuously on R, right? What is this? This is an element of an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, right? Why is it infinite dimensional? Because each, each position R corresponds to an eigenstate, right? And there are an infinite number of positions, right? Right? So if I want, for instance, to write down uh, the scalar product of, of two states, the inner product of psi, and phi, right? How do I write it? I write it as an integral, right? Psi r, phi r, psi r, d cubed r, right? This is an integral, right? And this integral over r, so there are, there, there is a, there are an infinite number of points, right? On the other hand, if I look at this system, if I have two states, psi and phi, what does my inner product look like? It looks like, uh, it's just the, just the inner product of a two dimensional state with another state, right? In this case, right, if I have m dot n, Right, that will be my my dot product. This will be just m one, n one, m two, n two, m three, n three. Right, but here, right, you have an infinite number of points. Right, so this is an infinite dimensional state. So, how do you uh, describe the action of this rotation? Right. Well, okay, no, so let me not use this uh, ket notation. Okay, we write it in the following way. We say exponent, right? Um, minus i and uh, minus i, right? Uh, theta, I'll explain what each one of these terms is doing, okay? Acting on This is how I would describe the rotation. And uh, instead of J, I should use L. Now, what is this? What are, what are, what are these quantities? Right? So you know that in three dimensions, any rotation, right, can be written as a rotation around a given axis, right? So there is always some axis some direction 
such that any rotation in three dimensions can be written as a rotation around that given axis. Okay, this is just a fact about rotations. So that is what this exponent corresponds to. Theta is the amount by which you are performing the rotation. N hat is the axis. And what is this L? Right? I have put a vector sign on this. So it must have three components. What are these three components? Can anybody tell me? What will these three components correspond to? Anybody? Vishnu, no? It's a rotation about x, y, z respectively. No, but how, what, what, what are they? That is my question. Like, what are they? LX, L, Y, and L, Z, like? Angular moment. Yeah, but uh, what? Are they matrices? What are they? That's what I'm asking, right? Mm. They are operators, but how do I how do I express them precisely? It's a... uh, are, are they are they are they like mm. finite dimensional matrices? What are What's they? Like infinite dimensional. They are right, but what is the expression for LX then? Uh, it's a, in, uh, we express it in R theta phi, right? So. Let me let me tell you. What is the angular momentum operator? Right? Angular momentum operator. What is this? Tell me. What is the angular momentum operator? Suraj? Aditya? Sir, R cross P. R cross P, right? So in the position representation, what does this become? Bharti, do you know what, what happens to the momentum in the position representation? How do I write the momentum operator? Bharti? If you, if you know, it's okay. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, Priya? So yes, sir. Minus i to h del op2. Right. Okay. So your angular momentum operator is this, right? R cross del. So these these components Lx, Ly, and Lz. What are they? So Lx is minus i h bar R cross del the x component of that. So that corresponds to y do z so z do uh, y. Okay. And so this object, right? This forms a representation of my group SO3, right? But it's an infinite dimensional representation, right? Because it acts on an infinite dimensional vector space. So, now, what is the point of, of, of all of this? Like, okay, great. I have some um, I have some um, something like this. So, so we are left with the following, right? We have some Hamiltonian. We have some solutions of that Hamiltonian, which are some eigenstates, let's say. Right? And then we have some unitary operators corresponding to some group transformation. Right? And what does it mean when we say that the system has the symmetry which is given by the group G, right? What does that mean? That means the following. It means 
that these unitary operators, which are representations of this group, right? They commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So if an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, we say that an operator is a symmetry of the, of the Hamiltonian. Okay. What does this imply, right? So let me take my state psi and let me transform it by acting on the state with uh, this operator, right? Now, what can I say about the state psi prime? The state psi is an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian. What about the state psi prime? So let me act on psi prime with H. So I can write this as H times U acting on psi. Right? But now note that these two commute. So if these two commute, what does that imply? That implies that H U is equal to U H, right? So I can write this expression as U H acting on psi, right? Now, what is H acting on psi? H acting on psi is E psi, right? Because as I just said, Psi is an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian, right? So what am I left with? I'm left with the following expression. H acting on Psi prime, which I'll write like this, is equal to E acting on Psi prime, right? Because remember, E is just a number, so I can pull it out which implies that psi prime and psi are eigenstates with the same energy. Are eigenstates of H with energy E, right? So the fact that my system has a symmetry, which is given by this unity operator, tells me that my states, my eigenstates are degenerate. Degenerate means that you have more than one eigenstate for the same eigenvalue. Okay. So this is, this is the first thing, okay. The second thing is the following, that if my eigenstates are degenerate in this way, okay. Now, what does this lead to? Well, we have the whole Hilbert space. Okay, so let's consider the whole Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of the system H, okay. Now, if you have some arbitrary state in the Hilbert, in this Hilbert space, right? If I have some arbitrary state in the Hilbert space, Right, it will, then this, this state is not necessarily uh, going to be an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian, right? Right, if I, so if I have two, for instance, if I have two eigenstates, I take a linear combination of those two eigenstates. That will give me a, a state which is not an eigenstate, right? 
right? So for instance, for spin one half, right? If I have my sigma z operator, one, zero, zero, minus one, and I say that this is my Hamiltonian, right? What are the eigenstates? Eigenstates are one, zero, and zero, one, right? These eigenstates, they form a basis for my Hilbert space, right? But if I have an arbitrary state, some alpha beta, let's say one, one, is this an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian? No. Not an eigenstate, right? Similarly, if you consider for uh, this thing, a hydrogen atom, okay? You consider an electron which is in a superposition of states. So you write the wave function as uh, some combination of, let's say it, it is in, uh, and I won't worry, well, I, I should write down the radial component also. So there is some radial component, uh, which depends on the, on the N, right? And then you have Y, L, M, theta phi, right? This, this is the total wave function. But I have some phi, which is, an eigen, which is a superposition of two different eigenstates. Hello. Right, so, and then we, this state is in a superposition of, of this N L M and N prime, let's say L prime M prime, right? Now individually, individually, each one of these is an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian, right? This is an eigenstate with, with energy given by N prime, it's in the nth orbital, and this is also an eigenstate. But phi is not an eigenstate, right? Okay, so I mean, I'm not saying anything very deep here, but I'm just reminding you. Uh, so if you consider your full Hilbert space, Okay, and you consider some eigenstate. Okay, so now we consider some eigenstate. Right? What happens if there is a symmetry? This will transform into psi prime, right? Psi prime is also an eigenstate. Okay, so imagine that this is your whole Hilbert space. Okay, and in this Hilbert space, there is a sector, right? There is some sector, there is some subset of states which is generated by taking this psi, right? You take this psi and you act on it with all possible group elements. Right? You act on it with all possible group elements. What happens? You get a subset of your Hilbert space, right? Which will, which I'll call, uh, HS, right? So HS is a subset of my Hilbert space. And this HS is invariant under the group, under this group transformation. Okay, 
what does this mean this means that for all states which are in this subspace hilbert in this subspace hs acting on this state gives you another element which is in the same subspace now this this subspace right uh let it will have some dimensionality okay so we'll say that let's say dimension of hs right what is the dimensionality of hs we'll just say it's n okay for the time being we don't know what n is we'll we will figure that out later right then hs will have a set of basis vectors right there will be a set of n basis vectors right which span this subspace right just to give you a very simple example uh you consider your 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 plain old cartesian coordinates right so you have x y and z right so if you just consider the set of vectors which lie in the x y plane right this is a subspace of your entire entire vector space right so that is what we are doing we are picking out a subspace of the full vector space okay so let us say that these n basis vectors are uh, labeled as uh, we'll call it we'll call it zeta zeta k okay so then this means that this eigen state psi that i had previously can be written as a superposition of my of of these zetas right i is equal to 1 to m right and what happens uh, so i actually i have to really quickly refer to my notes right so so we have psi belongs to h let h of r be the subspace of h which is invariant under r let psi of k be a basis of h of r right so we can write any state as a superposition of this basis now now we consider the action of this unitary operator on this psi okay so now we consider the action of this unitary operator u of g on this psi this gives us some psi prime and since psi prime is in the same subspace i can write it as a sum of uh these vectors with a different set of coefficients right okay right? because it's in the same subspace so it's like saying that you have a vector uh right which is in the xy plane and it you rotate it to another vector in the xy plane right so you stay within the same subspace then how would you uh, what is the relationship between uh, psi prime and psi psi prime would be equal to um you can write it okay one second oops psi prime is equal to ci prime zeta i and this can be written as 
some matrix R um, IJ CJ eta I. And so you have a sum over I and J. Right? What is this matrix R of IJ? R of IJ is, is transforming your coefficients uh, so that you go from psi to psi prime. And what is this R I J? This constitutes another, this constitutes a representation of, of the group G. Okay. And the dimension of R is called the dimension of the representation. Okay. Um, so to, to wrap up, uh, I'll just, uh, give you an example of, of such an invariant subspace, okay? Um, yeah, my, my, I'm getting a little bit confused right now. Just let me think about this for a second. Okay, yeah, my mind is blank. So I'm going to leave it for, for the next class. All right, so, uh, so we'll, we'll continue in the next class. Uh, and, uh, and I realize that uh, a lot of this is, is, is abstract. I mean, but if you understand it, if you understand even some small portion of this, right? It will make some, it will make a big difference for you going forwards. Okay. So what, what have I talked about today? I've, I've talked about uh, what happens, how does a group uh, act on a physical system? Okay. And I've described the notion of representations. And then after that, I gave you some examples. And then I've described the notion of an invariant subspace. Right, and uh, how that invariant subspace gives you a representation of your group. And in the next class, we'll I'll give you examples of such such representations. Okay, and I guess I will stop here for today. Any questions? No questions? Okay, then I guess I'll stop the recording. Okay, I will see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.